We're back. Alyssa, we're back. Are we? We are. We are. It's time. Here we are. Welcome to Conversations in Commerce. I'm your host, Andrew Alford. So glad to be here. With me today is my co-host, Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, how's it going today? I'm very good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Um, so it's been roughly a year since we've done one of these, right? Um, by my count, what do you what do you have? A year and six months. A year and a half. Okay, yeah. wow. Well, the good news is we're back and we've got all sorts of brand new content and exciting things to share with you today. Um, before we get started, though, let's let's pick up. Where have we been since the last show, Alyssa? What have you been doing? Oh, all over the place. We have been doing expos. We've been doing. We've been traveling. We've been uh, planning things. I mean, we've just been all over the place. Um, just uh, improving our marketing in general. Um, at least I, I can speak from the marketing side. I, I I don't know. You might know a little bit more about what Liftoff's doing. <laughs> otherwise, I don't know. I was kind of hoping that you would have all the answers for me. <laughs> So let's go ahead and introduce our first guest. Uh, Our guest has transitioned his marketing experience and his predisposition to authenticity into a successful e-commerce career. His career mission these days is to evangelize the necessity of having well-executed e-commerce solutions while empowering his clients to be successful. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Jeff Howell. Welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. So, um, Jeff, you're with Coverdale Group, right? Tell us a little bit about your your origin and I guess uh, how you got to where you are today. Sure. Well, I was born on the planet Krypton and raised (laughs) by these old Most of us were, right? Yeah. No, so I I started my career in printing, actually, um, back back when tech school was a thing for high school students. I I learned sort of the... the beginnings of offset lithography and offset printing and so my, my career after high school I started working for a large print shop and then moved over into digital pre-press and then transitioned into marketing and then website and, and things like that um, but I always sort of you know kept my hand around kind of what the print industry was doing and after a few just random jobs and not much luck after moving to Michigan. Um, I started working with Mike who owns Coverdale group and between him and myself and Kyle, we have grown that business quite extensively to having uh, lots of people that work for us and lots of customers. And uh, we are, have a global reach of hundreds of, of clients that we work with um, all within this web to print industry. So um, I have the great fortune of leading a, a great team of variable print developers that uh, work in PageFlex and Chili Publish to help manage this whole variable print side of our business. So I think we, you and I have run circles in the industry to kind of side by side for a while, just kind of apart, right? Um, and. I know you've worked with a lot of different platforms. I think, you know, prior to liftoff, you know, we were kind of working on the same platform, like 451 as an example. What what sort of platforms do you have in your repertoire um, that you can share with us? Sure. Well, obviously, you know, our, our two primary are 451 and liftoff. Um, we also do work with uh, DB Commerce, which utilizes Chili Publish. We do some work with Zeno. We do some work now. We're just rolling out some um, um, uh, Shopify work, and we're also uh, learning PageFlex Storefront through this whole process as well. So we have quite a few platforms that we we run support on and do variable print templates on. So it's uh, quite an extensive portfolio, which which makes the day-to-day work pretty exciting because you never really know which platform you're going to be called to work on from day to day. I know that's got to be something, right? And even if they're using similar variable print uh, programs like, I don't know, PageFlex, um, everybody has like a slightly different way that they're implementing that. Am I right? Yeah. There there are different nuances to how each of those templates are set up. Correct. So I guess that brings us on to the the topic uh, for today, which is web to print for the win. There we go. We have a nice graphic up there. Um, so in this particular uh, podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into what web to print is. We're going to talk about all the concepts, um, you know, how to realize success, uh, 
maybe some points of failures along the way. But ultimately, we want to help you understand what you can uh, do with web to print and how you can utilize it to be successful in your business. So um, for today's show, we sort of made two assessments. Um, one is you're either familiar with web to print and all the concepts and everything that that comprises, um, or you know absolutely nothing about the subject. And that's, ke- that's cool, because in either case, we have some pretty cool stuff planned for this show today. And it's one of the reasons that we brought Jeff with us today is because he is an expert in web to print. And I guess before I get uh, too far uh, down the road, we need to define what web to print is. Now, Alyssa, can you, why don't you tell me in your words what web to print means to you? Hmm, maybe uh, printing things off the web? Well, I mean, that's close, but I think we probably need a little bit more definition, right? Um, Jeff, why don't you help us out? What's, what's the best definition you can give us for web to print? So the best definition that I can provide is utilizing a, an online portal in order to um, output or produce a um, tactile piece, right? So you're using a, a digital a digital medium to then ultimately produce a physical medium, um, whether that be uh, printing something locally after you download it from a portal or having those files being sent to some sort of vendor or supplier uh, to produce on their own presses. That's that's kind of the in a nutshell. That's what web to print is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So web to print is more or less, and I'm just maybe I'm recapping and paraphrasing, but. It's the process of allowing your customer to design or customize something online, right? With the on with the result of being like an automated push of like prepress and collateral and maybe data to a print manufacturer or a supplier somewhere in the process, right? Um, resulting in little to no internal data entry or prepress efforts by your team. That the savings alone are huge, right? Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. I mean, the, the whole the whole beauty of the web to print process is it, a lot of this happens behind the scenes. And, and I love the topic of web to print because there's always been this misnomer, especially in the marketing circles, that you know print is dead and, and digital is, is sort of the main way to get your message out. Right? You, you hear about all these things, about magazines closing up and newspapers dying. But I think the, the idea is that, that print has been augmented into something that's almost more specialized and personalized. And there was a big component of my career back in the day where I was seen as a integrated marketing specialist. So I would utilize both digital and physical medium in separate marketing campaigns, you know, whether it be something with, you know, QR codes or, or pearls, you know, personalized URLs or, you know, something else that would be printed on a physical medium that would be either mailed out or dropped off or handed to that drove somebody to some sort of digital contact, whether it be a, a V card on a QR code or it be, you know, a, a, a website or a landing page that somebody would scan off of this physical medium. And, and I think that the most creative ways of utilizing print, especially web to print, um, are there to really augment really great marketing campaigns. Um, you know, there's a lot of places that are using, you know, AR with printed material. Like I've seen Audi. Audi has been a really good um, uh, organization or big, uh, great company that uses a, you know, AR in uh, in magazine ads, you know, where you can hold up your phone or some other device to the, you know, to the advertisement and you get to interact with it and see some cool stuff. Um, but all that being done, you know, through the print medium. And so when I when I think of web to print and then having somebody being able to go online mm. to to produce that, where it kind of takes out the the middleman of having that that specialized uh, electronic prepress person, it, it eliminates some of the middleman and it eliminates some of the human error, and it kind of puts the the responsibility of the uh, the proofing and production of that piece that's being produced, you know, onto the, the order taker or the person that's sourcing that piece. And, and I think it, it really generates a lot of responsibility, but also excitement for the person that's, that's ordering that because then, Hey, yeah, you know, I'm responsible for the content on this and it kind of gives me a, a great avenue to expand 
you know, whatever campaign I'm trying to work on. So there was a lot. I want to unpack this a little bit. There's, I mean, there's a ton of applications, right? Uh, and it's just not like what people used to think when web to print first came out. Let me customize a business card. Let me make that process easier. It goes far beyond that, right? We, you just, you talked about a lot of different applications. You talked about like variable print mail. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of other products. I think I heard in there, sorry, I didn't catalog all of them, but um, I mean, the reality is um, product customization is, is kind of king these days. Um, and it's not just about print. Um, I, I think a lot of it's crossing over into promotional apparel. You see a lot of online uh, decorating solutions. Bring your logo into it. I mean, even photos nowadays. Um, and so the, the reality is I think a lot of the products that we even have in our own house nowadays are probably sourced through variable print tools where um, there's data coming in from somewhere. It's being customized one-to-one -one with a user. Um, you think about that, like the stuff you get in the mail, you get something from, let's say, your insurance agent that says, hey, Andrew, imagine realizing these savings. And they have real tangible data that they can they can implement in that piece that really speaks to you in, in more of a one-to-one -one manner. And that's really powerful for marketing, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, and actually, you bring up a couple of different good points and good examples. You know, I've got I've got two kids, you know, one who's in college who just kind of went through the college process. And then I have an, another one that is beginning to go through the college process. And and both of them received some pretty high quality, specialized and personalized print materials that I know for a fact that it wasn't some graphic designer that sat down at a machine and then output those designs. It was the designs that were already created they went to a, a web to print portal and just input some variable information and it produced that item for them. Um, another good example is I was when I was in San Diego a couple of weeks ago and where the hotel that I was staying at is directly across the street from Petco Park where the Padres play. And I was talking to somebody just kind of discussing what I do. And I used the example of some of these very large um you know, player banners that would hang from, you know, that would hang from the, uh, from the park that had, you know, their name and maybe some advertisers, um, you know, the player's name and, and they had some cool graphics on it. And I told the person I was talking to, I was like, I guarantee that that wasn't done by just some, some designer in, the, in front of a Macintosh computer putting those out. It was, you had somebody from the advertising agency that runs for the Padres and they went to a web portal, they selected their design, and they uploaded a graphic of the, of the player. They typed in the player's name. They, they decided which logos for the businesses they wanted on that, and then they sent it off to print. I mean, the web to print is used for in so many different ways, including promotional products that you just discussed before. In fact, we're working with a, with a large distributor now that has everything from pom poms to those little um those little uh, like cheer megaphones that have logos printed on them there's ribbons and buttons and stickers and tattoos that all of this stuff is all highly customized and things that you can order um from a web portal that all you need to do is input a little bit of information you have something customized and then you get something in the mail or drop ship to you that is wearable and used for whatever it might be in a, in a promotional sense. And that's all done via web to print. So I mean, that's, it's, it's really incredible, right? The power of web to print is, is something else, but just like anything else, just like anything in the world of marketing and sales, it is never as easy as build it and they will come. Right? So even with a great marketing strategy, um, it isn't always a direct hit. I mean, what I mean is, you know, let's say you spent the money, you've done the due diligence, you think you know your market, you get the word out there, but sometimes that's not enough. And so I think um, maybe there's some ideas that we can run through here to help our audience understand how to better get into web to print, uh, especially if you're new or maybe you're struggling to get um, some traction with it. Um, you know, I've got some ideas of my own and, and, and Jeff, you know, you tell me, I think part of it starts with maybe finding the right platform for your need, not necessarily a platform, but one that is more contextually close to the end result you're looking for, right? Um, you know, there's, there's not always a silver bullet in some cases. And I think part of it um, is 
Sometimes it's a mix match of different platforms, solutions, integrations. Um, and so, um, I don't know, maybe let's pick that apart for, for just a second. I mean, I, I love my platform. We love Liftoff. Um, it's not to say that there are some things that it can't do or some scenarios where it isn't necessarily the, the best uh, solution for that user. And I think, you know, we, we often have to be honest with our subscribers about that. They come to us and they say, this is what we want to do. We'll make an honest evaluation of that and say, we may not be the, the right solution for it. Um, are there are there any particular delineators that come to mind? Like when you make a decision for one platform or another, say this will be liftoff, this will be 451, this will be you know wherever that that um, that work goes. What what makes you decide? You know, what are some factors you look at? Yeah, so I think I think some of the the main driving factors in helping a, a customer choose what is going to work for best for them. Uh, a lot of it includes, you know, the the purpose and or reason why the site's existing. Because there there are two different two different ways, you know, companies do business. They're either a B two B where they're they're creating a portal for an existing customer of theirs, where it's generally only going to be agents and employees of that one company going to the portal to order their product. Uh, or in some cases, especially when we're talking about maybe this this promotional product company I was just referring to a minute ago, it's B2C. And so the, the way to think or process um, what platform to select sort of changes based on those requirements. If you're doing a B2B, you don't necessarily care so much about having a platform that is wide open to Google and able to be indexed, right? Or the or the the product landing pages to be indexed properly, or having a lot of opportunity to do SEO for meta keywords and tags and descriptions. Not that those platforms don't have that capability, but it isn't quite as important. If you're doing a lot of B2C type stuff, I mean you definitely need to have and it's one of the whole goals is to is to be able to optimize and SEO those landing pages so people can can find them when they're searching on Google or Bing or some other search engine. So you have to have a platform in the B to C instance that can be easily indexed and searched by Google. So those are two, you know, those are kind of the first questions that I ask. And then it comes down to, you know, the UI and UX. Like is there are there some platforms that have a really nice uh, smooth, modern-looking, mobile-responsive UI that either can be customized. So, you know, we we at Coverdale we have the opportunity to build custom themes, and some platforms are easier to develop on than others. So, it's like, what's the look and feel? How customized do you want it? How much? How mobile-responsive do you need it? And again, some platforms are better at that at that than others. Um, you know, integrations like what kind of types of integrations are. Um, are you expecting to implement web, you know, tax web services, actual rate shipping, um, order management systems, inventory control systems, um, ERP backend, so you know, bookkeeping and and billing, you know, so those are a lot of considerations that you have to have when you're trying to select a platform. What's going to be the the smoothest to transfer from? Because ultimately. You know, you're not you're not starting from scratch in a lot of these instances. Either you've got an old site that you need to transition to something more modern, or um, you know you're converting from one platform to another. Could be going from 451 to liftoff, or vice versa. You know, so there's a consideration there of you know ease of of transferability. All right, so Jeff, it sounds like bottom line is um, you know you really need a good, excellent user experience um, in order to ensure that you get adoption of, of your app. Um, it's definitely important that, um, oh, you guys hear that? You know what that means, it's time, it's time for? Supply chain chatter. Supply chain chatter, all right. So this is the segment of the show where we talk about what's going on in the industry right now, and I think we've got some news to share with you uh, on today's show, and I think, Alyssa, you're gonna deliver that news for us, right? Well, speaking of news, Liftoff has recently reached PCI DSS Level 1 Version 4 compliance. Wait, did you say Level 1? I did. 
you know that level one is uh, basically for folks that do six million uh, transactions a year and higher, right? Yes, it is. That's uh, that's actually a pretty intense level. Uh, right. I think a lot of the folks in this industry are operating somewhere around three or two. Um, that's actually really intriguing to hear. So, Jeff, let me let me ask your opinion. So. Um, PCI, like uh, those types of compliance, the SOC two things like that. Um, I mean, those, those are pretty critical, right? In our in our industry, especially when you're dealing with commerce and, and transactions. Um, I don't know. What do you think? What, what's your What's your feedback on that? Well, I mean, obviously, it, it's it's almost a requirement for most merchant accounts to connect to your platform. Um, you have to have you know be able to prove some sort of you know compliance in that in that industry. But we take it for granted, though, right? Because it used to be, I think, you know, back when I when I was working with another platform, um, like it was big news that we we you know, shared with everybody that we are now PCI compliant. And now it's almost like people take it for granted that you know you, you're always giving your credit card, you're always giving your 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 you know bank account information, whether it you know, be through PayPal or any of these other payment gateways. And so it's like, okay, you say that you're PCI compliant or level one compliant. It's like, okay, great. What does that mean for me? But it's, 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 I mean, obviously it, it has to, you 100% need as much compliance as you possibly can if you're going to be able to grow and work with any of these other merchant accounts and payment yeah. gateways to accept transactions. I mean, it's, do you, um, Coverdale, do you guys, uh, I don't know, do, do you have clients that send you like security questionnaires, things like that, asking you questions? Then some, some of them are, I guess, pretty yeah. invasive, right? Oh, a lot of highly regulated companies that we work with will, will require some sort of questionnaire to be completed that, you know, kind of talks about uh, either our platform that we work with, you know, platform compliance, or, you know, if we are, you know, regulated or have some compliance to any kind of regulation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it's, I think it's definitely critical nowadays. And I think what you said earlier is people seem to take it for granted. Right. Um, in a lot of cases, they'll maybe just assume that you've got that level of compliance. And I guess maybe just the message for everyone is just make sure you know exactly what your, you know, what your platform, uh, has from a standpoint of compliance and security. Um, you, you're uploading your data, right? You're uploading your data and your client's data into there. That's such a liability, um, so, you know, having PCI, SOC, those kind of certifications really offer really sound peace of mind, right? I, I believe so. I mean, because it, it helps put that that guard in place, you know, to help manage the transaction data. Oh, not to interrupt, but I have some more news for you guys. Sure. What's up? Well, our friends over at BrandChain recently joined Printing United. Oh, that's exciting news. Printing United is a pretty, pretty major outfit. Um, yeah, speaking of brand chain, I think that's that's probably where I I grew up in this industry, starting with DMIA, then PSDA, and now brand chain. That's that's quite the jump. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine that's going to be a pretty big benefit for the members of brand chain being part of Printing United, which has a lot, and I mean a lot of resources. And every year they have uh, some of the most uh, amazing and incredible uh, expo shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, this industry puts on. And so I, I think that's great. I think that's a, a really great uh, move for the folks at BrainChain. And uh, I would imagine that our members have a lot in store. Um, now, what about the, the leadership meeting? Every year there's an annual leadership meeting. Will we still be having one of those this year? Yes. So the leadership summit will be taking place in May in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, BrainChain will still be putting this on. It will be their last leadership summit. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, we'll be there. Liftoff will be there. I don't know. Will Coverdell be there, Jeff, by chance? I am hoping so. <laughs> All right. We're, well, we're, if you're there, make, we'll see you. We're making plans if... to show up, so let's. Well, I'm hoping that we'll be there. And we got to get our viewers there too. If you guys uh, are watching this show, we want to see you there. It'd be cool to see you in person and uh, have some real conversations in real life, not this virtual stuff that we're doing right here. Um, Alyssa, do you have anything else for us in the way of news or anything like that? I don't think we had anything else planned out. Okay. All right. Well, then that's <laughs> where we'll go through. So um, I want to take a minute and talk about some breakthrough stuff that's going on in the industry. Um, a lot of people don't really think about this as print um, or promo, and uh, maybe they struggle to, to understand the applications of it. But this is one thing that I think um, is important. Hold on one second. This is, this is one of my favorite things to play with these days is 
3D print. Um, this, it's actually pretty incredible. What I've got here is a, a working engine that was actually printed. Um, now, you think of 3D print, you know, like, well, okay, uh, what are the applications? Does it really actually mean anything to me as a distributor or even as a supplier, as a product that I can offer? Um, I mean, outside of it being cool, I, I see many applications. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to take the first stab, I've got my own ideas, but 3D print, I don't know. What do you think? What, what are the applications? You know, I think I think it's still early enough in its adapt, um, adoption where the the print industry. Well, I'll preface this by saying this: the print industry has always been a slow-moving beast, right? Um, not always, you know. It, it, as much as the technology is always evolving, it, certain components of the industry has always been a little bit more slow-moving. And obviously, three D printing has gained a lot of traction in model making, prototyping, um, and, and, and those, you know, make it, maker spaces, right? People are purchasing these small little desktop or even the large, you know, printers to create things that you used to take you know, months or years to hand mold and, and hand prototype. As it relates to our industry, though, I think it, 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 it's going to take a little bit of augmentation of the, the way that the print files interact with the 3D printers, meaning the, the way that you create these 3D printed material, the pieces, um, they still require some manipulation in some sort of CAD software and you know, computer aided design software. And I think unless until there's a a really good and correct me if I'm wrong, but until there's a really good way to have an online version of some of these tools, um the the 3D printing part of it might not be quite as accessible to everybody to the general public as as maybe we'd like it to be. But as, like, say, a print and promo uh, distributor, I think it, it, it generates a lot of opportunity to have somebody in-house as sort of a product engineer that can sit down and create some stuff, right? And can produce some prototyped um, promotional products that can be, you know, customized and handed out to people as a you know hey look what we can do or look what we have the potential to almost using as a sales tool or you know taking you know going to like a a trade show of some sort and saying you know hey this is where we think the industry is going and we want to be on the cutting edge of of creating these sort of um you know personalized quick turn prototype you know type promotional products i think that that's a good good way are a good direction that 3D printing can go in regards to our industry and our vertical. Um, but I still think it's going to take a little bit of time to make it more accessible to everybody. So I was having a really cool conversation the other day with uh, one of our, our clients. And while it's it's not a big part of their business, they do prototyping. You mentioned that a few times. And I was curious, so I kind of pressed for, you know, what what is it exactly that you're prototyping? And it's, it's everything from, like, you know, swag toys, right? Before you send them off to manufacturing, you know, somewhere, right? And mass produce them. Uh, great for prototyping, those kinds of things. Um, but then there was another uh, use that um, they, they talked to me about, which was really kind of compelling, which is branded 3D print, where, um, you know, they, uh, let's say you have employees that are signing into, uh, you know, brand new employees, part of a new HR program. And part of that is that they get like a little swag kit and there's things that are kind of personalized to them. But they, they took it a little bit further and they, they injected some, you know, movable, animatable, you know, kind of like 3D print pieces um, that incorporated things like their name and, and things in there. So now they have this cool toy that, that is personalized like with their name, like it's not just printed on there. It's, it's actually part of the piece. And, you know, I, I kind of thought that was that was kind of cool. And it reminded me of a campaign that Coke had done years ago with HP on uh, on the indigo presses where they were customizing the name so you could walk into the store and you could say you know hey there's jeff there's my name or there's andrew or Alyssa, and you know there was there was a there was a can for everybody and you know that was really out of the box thinking right what can you do with the power of variable print 
Um, and in this case, what, what is the power of 3D print, right? Uh, like you said, there's a lot of unknowns, right? It, it's it's kind of like the Wild West, right? You know, we're, we're kind of at a juncture where it's starting to become relevant in business. It's been around for, what, 10 years? And so now it's it's about, you know, how do we use it? What are the implica- applications? Because the technology has now caught up and the, the products are actually phenomenal. Uh, you got manufacturers like Bamboo Lab out there generating some really incredible um, consumer-grade equipment that's really starting to bring all of this home at a, at a really affordable price. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think that the barrier to entry on this stuff is pretty low at this point. It, you know, it used to be, you know, super expensive, but now I think you're, you're correct in, in the assessment that the, the barrier to entry to, to getting some of this material, the, the, the raw materials, the substrates are, are, you know, much more reasonable. You know, and I think that that, that example that you just said about the new employees getting something that, that was more customized, that was 3D printed, is a great employee activation. And, you know, I could see um, creating some kind of little trinket that could be personalized while somebody waits at a trade show. You can do some sort of consumer activation at that point. You know, going to like a a social media conference or a or a print industry conference and you've got your little you know 3d printer set up and somebody comes in and says hey you know uh, uh, I'm, I'm interacting with you and then you know they get to a certain level of of interaction and communication they give given a certain amount of information and all of a sudden you know here somebody at, at the conference and spits out this little prototype that is personalized to them I think that's a really cool activation that would make it memorable um, and uh, just a matter of, of, you know, just but, but coming up with something that, that is unique and somebody needs to, and it's not me, because I'm not quite, <laughs> that, I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of, of, of strategic mind. Not but me either. Nope. I know that there's somebody out there that, that is thinking about this and can find a way to overcome some of the challenges to make 3D printing much more accessible to the general public. And I know it'll happen. Um, when and how, that's the question. Sweet. Um, oh, hey, it is time for our next segment. How about that? Um, this will be uh, one of our last segments. Uh, this is Tech Trends. All right, so this is where we talk about some of the cool things that are, are going on um, right now in our industry. But instead of cool things, let's, let's, let's have a real conversation because I think most of the conversation around tech in our industry, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's about cybersecurity. It's it's about securing and fortifying, um, you know, you know everything that is yours, everything your clients touch. And you know, we were talking about PCI earlier, and uh, not that I want to continue that conversation, but um, yeah. you know, in in our own uh, quest for getting to PCI, we we encountered that a lot of our suppliers and a lot of our distributors and customers and people we interact with every day were falling very well short of some of the security requirements. Uh, not just that PCI has, but, you know, just, you know, basic, you know, lock in and protect your, your stuff. And so these are conversations that I think are super critical uh, right now. Uh, I don't know. Like, what do, what do you think? What do you think the state of the industry is? If you were to, you know, take the pulse of the industry right now in terms of um, their health and posture on cybersecurity, it'd probably be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not super happy with that aspect of where we are. Um, you see, what, what what I found in just interacting with with um, distributors, subscribers, and then platform developers such as Liftoff, um, there 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 is a lack of focus on uh, exceeding any kind of industry standard for security. And many of the distributors and subscribers that we interact with who are our customers don't have any kind of in-house IT department. So not only are they kind of lacking in the online security space, many of them don't have any internal IT department. They have no disaster recovery plan. They have no off-site uh, server farms. They have no no off-site data storage, and they have no plan for holding customer information other than kind of what the stock platform services already already established, right? 
which is you know through PCI compliance and you know, SSLs for their you know domain certificates and such. So that's a little scary that that many many distributors just don't have that that forethought of how are we managing all of this data that we're taking in, you know where people are passing you know Google Sheets and Excel file sheets back and forth that have names and phone numbers and obviously not social security numbers but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of people's data just basic data being passed back and forth just via email or or ticketing yeah. systems with 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 uh, spreadsheets and stuff so i don't have a good answer for it i just know that um the 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 print industry is is on the precipice of something possibly happening i don't know for sure and i'm and i think we're fortunate i i think we're fortunate that nothing has happened in the print industry to be honest well it reminds me though i i think something has happened right so about a year ago maybe six months to a year ago um i won't name names but there was one of the larger suppliers in the print industry that um uh nearly succumbed to an attack in terms of their their network operations telephones um, and, um, you know, it, it definitely underscored the need for it. Uh, I think as an industry, um, you know, we all dealt with it very quietly, but I think the, the reality is we need to be shouting from every rooftop, you know, Hey, this is an issue. This is a problem because yeah. you called it, you said it just now we're on the precipice of something potentially very large. Um, and, and, and those of us that are un unprotected are, are going to be at huge risk. And the fact is with so many of us at risk, um, even the folks that are protected soon become vulnerable just because of the, their relationship, the, the fact that they're, they, they've got interconnected systems and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely concerned about it. Um, you know, being a technology provider and working with our subscribers, part of what we try to do is instill that knowledge, right? Don't do this, do this. You know, these are best practices. But at the end of the day, you said it, they don't have their own IT folks. Uh, a lot of times they, they, they don't know what they don't know. And I think a part of it is just awareness, right? Just massive major industry awareness uh, through some sort of campaign. I don't know what we're saying we're going to do about it, but it's a problem. Yeah, it is. And again, similar to the, you know, to the 3D printing thing we just discussed, it's going to take somebody with a, um, with a solution, right? To come up and say, you know, here, here's a, here's a solution for this problem. Let's run with it. And, um, I think I think that it it should start with at least building some awareness, which that isn't even that that basic spotlight on this problem isn't even really being talked about. So I think even just build building awareness about the fact that, hey, we've got a problem here, w would even be a good place to start. Yeah, I I don't know. As an industry, we need to come together and we need to solve it. And there's a lot of um. You hear that? Oh, you know what that means, Alyssa? You know what that means? Cash it's or swag? Cash uh, or swag? Cash or swag? We're, it's, it's time. Jeff, this is the part of the show where we get to... And wow, you're running out of time. Look at that. Here, let's fix that. <laughs> uh, hold on one second here. Hey, these things don't ever go off without a hitch. So this is the part of the show where we give Jeff a prize for, for being such a great uh, guest on our show. And Alyssa has, I see it already. I see it, the wheel, the prize wheel. Favorite part of the show. So here's the thing. We've got, we've got money. We've got swag. Jeff, what do you want? What are you hoping to get off this thing? What am I hoping to get? Yeah. Oh, nothing but just exposure, guys. I don't, I'm not in it for the money or the swag. Wink, wink. Well, let's find out. Tell, right. tell, just count to three. Tell her when to do this thing. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy. All right, do it. Go for it. It's spinning. It's going. Where's it going to land? We don't know. It is... A swag bundle. Swag bundle. All right. Oh, that's, that's actually nice. pretty awesome, Jeff. We've got something really cool to send your way. A big box full of swag. I got an example of like some cups and stuff that are right behind me. Um, who knows? You might even get one of these nice fancy North Face. I don't know what we've got left, but heck, we're going to pack that, that box full for you. Okay? That's awesome. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate you being a guest on our show today. And I know um, we, we covered a lot and there's some things we didn't get a chance to cover. And so I hope you'll uh, entertain at some point being a guest on a future show and 
really hope you enjoyed your time here with us today. I would be happy to, to be back anytime you'd like me to, and I, I did enjoy it. I love doing these things. This is a uh, this is always fun. Sweet. Awesome. Well, we're, we'll go ahead and sign off for uh, everybody and your viewers back home. Thank you so much for, for watching and investing your time in, in our show. And uh, we hope to see you around for episode three. Until then, thank you for being the best part of Liftoff in our community. Thank you so much. <laughs>